Let's go ahead and start uh, by opening our Bibles to Song of Solomon, which, if you're using one of the Bibles from the church, is page 775. It begins, verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. So that's your lengthy and in-depth introduction to this. It's the Song of Songs. So uh, if you have a Bible with footnotes, you'll see that there's a, a reference there to 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, which says about Solomon, it's kind of a summary of uh, his reign and his accomplishments. It says, he spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. So he was prolific, not only at Proverbs, but also songs. But we really only have one song preserved. So it's interesting that his father uh, maybe didn't write as many songs, but his songs are different, and I would not hesitate to say better. Um, so Solomon, and we remember the book of Ecclesiastes, we believe written by him. You see this man who started well but didn't finish well. Uh, became uh, really totally backslidden by his compromises, which in some way sort of, uh, you know, impact our view of the Song of Songs and his relationship with this woman. While we appreciate it, we also know that he had over a thousand women in his harem by the time he was done accumulating uh, the objects of his desire. So uh, we appreciate what he writes here and what's written here and, and all of that, but it's all within a context. So it's... Um, it's one of his many songs, so they, this is included, it's the song of the song, so it considered the, you know, the, the number one hit, I guess, so you want to say that. Now, when you did your reading, if you have a Bible that has, you know, breaks it into paragraphs, you'll see that uh, whoever did that for you made some decisions, interpretations of who's speaking. So if your Bible, it might say the Shulamite, Daughters of Jerusalem, Shulamite, the Beloved, uh, there's a chorus. There's several different voices uh, that are speaking here. Uh, there's even one spot where, you know, it could be interpreted that maybe this is the Lord's response to all that's happening. Uh, so remember, when you're reading this, it's a poem. So it's presented in a way that it's not, it's not a historical narrative. This isn't the, the account from sort of a biographer's uh, perspective of their relationship. It's not saying, well, they went on this date on this day and... And she thought this, and then, you know, this is from her journal, and then this is what he said, and then this is what happened next, and this is what her father said. This isn't written like that. It's a poem. So uh, being a, a poem, it needs to be viewed uh, and interpreted as though it's a poem, which means there are going to be places where symbolic language is used, referencing something. They're going to describe each other's physical appearance. And some of it now is very pastoral. A lot of it's very uh, nature-oriented, and what we would call pastoral in the sense that it's these pasture or pastoral kind of uh, images. Um, and some of them, I don't know that you want to go through here and use this on your girlfriend because if you tell her that her neck is like a tower, she might not think that's a great thing or that her hair is like a flock of goats. It's like, well, that's the look I was going for, you know, goat herd on the side of the mountain. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. So, uh, you know, it meant something... So we're going to have different voices, and, uh, and those are interpretations, and, uh, and as interpretations, then they're, they're debatable. So this is one of the places where, you know, the Bible says not to quarrel. Paul warns, you know, tells Timothy, be careful about getting into arguments. So to me, I think I would just suggest to you that we would treat the Song of Songs the way we would treat any parable or something that we would, that's given to us in the Scripture that would be highly symbolic. And that is, if you can understand the main point of the parable, this, and, and not to say that there might be other points that are uh, sub-points that you'll find in a parable, but one of the ways that people go, uh, they get off track in trying to interpret a parable is to try to assign some really concrete meaning that has heavy implications to every single detail in the parable. And that, frankly, can get you into trouble because then you begin to start interpreting and making well, this means this, and this means that. And once things don't have a, like a one-to-one -one correlation with something, or it's very direct, uh, and it's not really interpreted in other places in Scripture, then really it's just someone's opinion. So uh, with this, it, to me it's very obvious there's one main takeaway. She really is into him, and he is really into her. 
Uh, I've, been, I've been preparing for the go through the Bible on these larger chunks of Scripture by uh, I speed up the audio Bible to double speed, and so I can get through Song of Solomon in 10 minutes. And so I listen to it over and over. I don't know how many times I listened to Song of Solomon this week. And uh, the more I listened to it, it wasn't until maybe around the 15th or 20th time through the thing that I finally thought, you know what? This, this story has one point, which is they're into each other. <laughs> and it's from the beginning to the end. There's other things happening, and there's, there's, a, there's a movement. We'll look at it. But, but primarily, they're really passionately interested in each other. And I think that's the main point. And I'd say that's the main takeaway. I wouldn't necessarily want to go through this book and say this is how you make your relationship grow. There's a verse in here that talks about how many concubines he already has and how many queens that he's already accumulated. So he's already got a bunch of ladies and he's found another lady. I don't know that God gave a song a song so that we can go through and figure out how to have a romantic relationship. I don't, I really personally, that's not what I think the value is. I think the value is the, the passion and the romance that can be sanctified and it's holy and it's not bad. And, and within the confines of marriage, God gave us this as a blessing. So um, that's my takeaway. Uh, there, you could go through this in great detail. And uh, it, you know, I don't know the, the value in all of that because then it just becomes one person's interpretation. Some of the imagery is very, very clear and they're describing each other. It's very, very clear. Um, but I think the main point is that she loves him and he loves her. You'll see here in chapter 1, uh, she describes herself. You know, she sees herself a certain way. Look at verse 5, just to, kind of as an example. She says, I'm, I'm dark but lovely. Uh, and she explains what she means by that. Oh, daughters of Jerusalem, I'm like the tents of Kedar and like the curtains of Solomon. So apparently Solomon's curtains were darker. And she said, don't look upon me because I'm dark because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me, and they made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I've not kept. So just like today, there are some cultures where the more tan you become, the less, less beautiful you are. Uh, some places where you get darker and it's less attractive. So people are super concerned about protecting their skin from the sun so they can keep a very pale appearance. So she had to work in the vineyard, so she's got a, she's got a nice tan. Whereas, you know, if you're, I guess now we, I mean, when I was a kid, tan was, you know, the thing. Now everyone's got skin cancer, so tan's not the thing. So in, her is more like an ascetic. So it's just, so there's just an example. You know, this, she's going to be describing uh, her own situation or her crying out for him. Uh, she's speaking to the daughters of Jerusalem and they're responding to her. And, and so this poem begins to unfold. And, and this is where we'll get to communion in chapter 2. Uh, he, she's been speaking in, at the end of chapter 1 and verse 16. She calls him handsome and pleasant and uh, you know how, how we're going to be blessed. And I'm the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valleys. And then he says to her in verse 2, like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. So all the other chicks, the ones in my harem, are nothing compared to you. It's hard for me to read this and not keep putting it in its context. So uh, he, you know, he's very interested in her. And then she responds in verse 3, like an apple tree among the trees of the woods, so is my beloved among the sons. Uh, I sat down in his shade with great delight, and his fruit was sweet to my taste. So I laid down in your shade and tasted your fruit. You know, I mean, they're, like, they're it. She's is very sensual. They're not, they're not involved intimately. This is not sexual. That, that happens later. There's, there's some pretty clear passage that talk, talks more, uh, you know, not, I wouldn't say pornographically or very graphically, but definitely moves to another, uh, another level of intimacy once you, they've had the marriage uh, happen. But at this point, uh, you've cho you know, she, he says, you're, you're the lily, you know, you're, the, you know, you're beautiful, you're the one, you're the, you know, they're thorns compared to you. And she says, well, you're, you're, this, you know, you're this beautiful shade that I can rest under and you, you know, you're the sweetness, you know, and I love you. And and then she says in verse 4, to, and she's speaking about their relationship. And I, verse 4 is just such a wonderful, beautiful picture. She says, he brought me to the banqueting house, and his banner over me was love. 
and goes on to describe, you know, how they were together and all that that means. And, and, but that phrase, he brought me to his banqueting house, he brought me to the place of celebration, and he put a banner over me, and the banner said love. I can't think of, we're, we're looking here at a, at, a, at a poem that's about this intense, passionate, romantic, love that these two are developing that transitions and turns into marriage and and they're they're just so excited about each other and we have in the bible uh, god speaking about the nation of israel and says israel's his wife and then in the new testament that same image it's a little bit different but then now the the church is the bride of christ and the return of jesus like we were singing randy chose that song on purpose you know like a bride waiting for a We're reading this book. We're studying this book. And it's a great song because the book of Revelation presents Jesus coming back. It's the wedding procession. The bridegroom is coming to get his bride and to bring her to his house. That's, that's what's happening. That's the, the Bible's a love story. It's a love story. It's a triumphant love story about how God overcomes. And I wanted to remind you, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. And Paul's talking about marriage, we assume... It sure seems like it. He's talking about the application of, of the grace that he emphasizes in the first three chapters of the book of Ephesians, and then he moves into our response and how we should uh, carry ourselves. Look at chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 15. Walk circumspectly, not like fools, redeeming the time, or as wise, not like, not like fools, but as wise, redeeming the time. The days are evil. Therefore, don't be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. So now he's talking about submission, our relationships to each other. Now he's going to talk about those relationships. He's going to talk about wives. That's verse 22. He's going to talk about husbands. That's verse 25. But jump down to chapter 6, verse 1. He's going to talk about children. Then in verse 4, he talks about fathers. Then in verse 5, he talks about bond servants, right? Then uh, he talks about masters in verse 9. So submit yourselves to one another. How do we carry ourselves with humility towards each other? Wives and husbands and children and fathers and servants and masters, right? So you look, like, talk, Paul's talking about behavior, right? And, but watch how this unfolds. Wives, verse 22, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He's the savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. And for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh." This is a great mystery. Look at verse 32. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Wait, I thought we were talking about being submissive to one another. So the wife shows it this way. The husband shows it this way. Now you're going to talk about children. Then you're going to talk about dads. Then you're going to talk about servants. Then you're going to talk about masters. Well, apparently he's gone on a detour. As he starts to talk about the husband and wife relationship, it so closely mirrors the relationship that Jesus has with us, ideally, that he can switch between the two to the point where, in the context, clearly talking about our relationship with each other, he completely moves off to another subject where he says, I'm, I'm talking about Jesus and the church right now. Wait, Paul, I thought you were telling me as a husband how to treat my wife. I was, and I am, and you should listen to what I'm saying but really, I'm giving you straight revelation about Jesus and his church. So now, let's go back and reread it, not thinking about how it applies to husbands, although we always should, husbands. When we read this, we should think, okay, that's Jesus, but it's me. But now we're going to look at it as just this emphasis. So look again at verse 25. 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Christ loved his church and he gave himself for the church so that, verse 21, that he might sanctify and cleanse her. Christ wants his church set apart and holy. Sanctify is the verb form of the noun holy, to be made holy, to be made separate. He's done that. And to wash her with the washing of water by the word. Jesus washes his church with the washing of the word. If you have a church that's got problems with dirt, what does the church need? It needs to be washed. How do you wash the church? You wash it with the washing of water by the word. And that he might present her to himself, a glorious church. So what's the analogy? It's bride and bridegroom. That the bridegroom would be presented to the bride, holy and without blemish, you know, washed and cleansed, that she would be able to come to him. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy without blemish. Now we go back to husbands. Husbands ought to love their wives, their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. Now we switch back. What does the Lord do to the church in verse 29? He nourishes it and cherishes it. He brought me to his banqueting house and his banner over me is love. He nourishes, brought me to his banqueting house. His banner over me is love. He cherishes me. It's right, the Song of Solomon verse, right? It's the same idea. I've been brought into the place where I have what I need. I've been brought by my bridegroom. He's brought me into his banqueting house and he put a banner. The banner is sort of, it's a standard. It would be, it's kind of a, mil, it's not really a romantic thing. It's, a, it's like a military standard. I was just uh, on Thursday and Friday at the Marine Corps Depot in Southern California in San Diego because my, uh, my brother's uh, youngest, one of his, he has twins that are his youngest, and one of the twins graduated from a Marine Corps boot camp. And it's a very moving experience. And well, the very end of the graduation ceremony is each platoon has a standard. They have a, they have a standard bearer. They've got the guy with the, with the flag, and it's got their platoon number on it. And these guys have been there 12 weeks getting screamed at and spit on and all the stuff that happens to you at boot camp. And, and so they're there, and, and, and so the guy comes out, the chief guy, and he's like, look, I'm gonna, we're going to take back our standards. You know, you're done. You've, you've served. This platoon is disbanded. You've done your job. And, and then they have this formal thing where the guys march out, and they, the, the drill instructors take the banner away. And now these guys are going to go on to their next deployment. You know, they get 10 days leave, and then I think it's 50, you probably know better than I do, Marissa, it's like 52 days or something at Pendleton for more military, you know, the more uh, structured training. And so here, here it is, the standard. The idea of a standard, it's a flag. It's a flag you carry into battle. It's like, this is who we are. For our country, we have a flag. It means something to us. And it's our, it's, it represents our values. It represents the best about us. Now, maybe we have, we're not perfect, but that flag reminds us of what we're supposed to stand for. It sort of reminds us we have a constitution, and that thing is amazing, <laughs> and it guarantees our rights, and it tells us how we're organized, and it tells us how we value. We may not live up to those ideals, but that flag speaks about our ideals. And so the flag means something. It ought to mean something. It's sad when it doesn't, and you know, maybe that's uh, you know, a statement about us, but here this picture of of, uh, in this passage, that he, he uh, nourishes and cherishes his church. And that idea is in the Song of Solomon verse. He brought me into his banqueting table and he put his flag. And what's, his, what's the flag? What's the standard? And he's not off that mission, by the way. He doesn't turn it in, you know. It's like he's on mission and what's his mission? His banner over me is love. So he nourishes and cherishes his church. Verse 30, he says, we're members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. He says, this is a great mystery. We become part of the body of Christ. If you've received Jesus Christ, you're part of the body of Christ. And you say, well, listen, I don't, go to, I don't go to church at this church. Well, this isn't the church. The church is the body of Christ. Part of it meets here, part of it meets over there, part of it meets down there, part of it meets in another place, some, some other country. Part of it, they speak a different language. Part of it, they're over there. The body of Christ, but, well, it's big. It, it spans the ages. You know, it spans centuries. The body, and we're part of it. Like a husband and wife become one, we're this great mystery. We become one with Jesus. 
Can you say such a thing? Doesn't seem how we we are. We've we've been made part of the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. So I'm speaking, he says, this is a great mystery, but I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. He goes back to marriage in verse 33. Let each of you love his, each one of you in particular love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Then he goes right to children. So this teaching on marriage, he just, he, he just so seamlessly moves right into the relationship of Jesus with his church and right back to the husband with his wife and right back to Jesus and right back to the husband. So husbands, if you, wanna, if you need help on how to be a better husband, go to the master. He knows. He knows how to do it. He's, he's the example. So uh, we have this as a New Testament teaching. And, and so as we think of communion, I can't think of a, of a better image uh, to think of Jesus with his disciples and gathering them around the table. It's Passover. That's a great image. And certainly that... You know, communion, think about that. But here's another way to think about it. I mean, I think with the Lord, he's so glorious. You can think about what he's done in so many different angles, and each one is brilliant and infinite. But here's a way to think of it. The bridegroom brings the bride to the banqueting table, to the banqueting room. And what table has Jesus made for us? I think of the Psalm 23. You know, he, he, he's made a table for me, set a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You think of those men the devil even going to come and, and, and possess Judas Iscariot as he leaves after that and, and surrounded by enemies. And Jesus sets a table and says, after the Passover is done and he takes the bread and breaks it and said, take this and eat it. This is my body broken for you. And they all eat it. And then he takes the cup and says, this is, this is the blood, my blood, the blood of the new covenant. I'm making a new covenant with man in my blood. Take this and drink it. He brought me to his banqueting table. He brought me into the banqueting room and he put his standard over us. And the flag that we're under, that our great king and and our great champion, his flag that he's planted in his banqueting room where we sit at this table and the banner says love, agape, God's unconditional love. And what table is that? I mean, I don't know. It's perfect. It's a perfect picture. So, okay, let's continue with our study. Thanks, guys, for coming up. You can uh, try to not do this during the Bible study with your cup. It's like a junior high camp thing, and you get you gotta, the cups are... whole Bible study. All right, back to Song of Solomon. I don't know what that's going to do to the recording, so Andrew, sorry. He just said, I think I can push pause somewhere. Hopefully he figured it out. So chapter 2, I wanted to point out uh, in verse 7 where she says, uh, there's this exhortation, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field. There's that pastoral motif that's happening the whole time, this sort of natural scene. By the gazelles or by the does of the field. And this phrase, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. It's a poetic expression, but the idea is there's so much passion already. I mean, verse 1, back chapter 1, verse, one, verse 2, I mean. Ver- chapter 1, verse 2 lets you know what the book is all about. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Your love is better than wine. Like, I love the taste of your mouth on my mouth more than any wine I've ever tasted. That's why I'm going to go through this faster. Like, you read it on your own. Uh, I'm, I'm not. If I say anything, I'm, I, it's not going to go good for me. There's nothing. I don't know. What do I say? You know, so. Uh, but here, this is important because there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of, of excitement about their coming together, their being together. And then there's this phrase that we read in verse 7, do not stir up nor awaken love until it's the right time, really. Like, there's restraint. This is very, very important when it relates to love. And I would would just suggest to you, married or unmarried, I, I think biblically, the primary way that you show love, whether you're unmarried or whether you're married, is self control. I think there's the idea that, no, you show love by you know, when someone's in love, they don't have self-control. No, no, that's not how you show love. That might be someone who's caught up in a fancy or caught up in an infatuation, and so they have no, 
They're not, they're gonna, they don't care what anybody thinks. They're going to do whatever they feel. They're going to be so over the top. That's not how any relationship grows. If you want to show love to somebody, if you're married and you want to show your wife that you love her, show, uh, show her that you have self-control. Do something that's in her best interest that's not in yours. Tell yourself no and say yes to something that you don't want to do that will be a blessing to her. Uh, we show, you know, right? That's what Ephesians 5 said to the husbands. Love your wife like Christ loved the church. Self-sacrificial. So the way that you show love is restraint. So physically in the relationship, uh, a husband would show his wife love by restraining himself and ministering to her needs. A wife would show her husband love by restraining herself and ministering to his needs. The Bible tells us it's in restraint. So here's this exhortation for them. Listen, they're having, they have all this passion and all this excitement and all this zeal for one another, but restrain yourself until it's the right time. And, uh, you know, this is repeated three times, and we'll point them out as we come to them. There's a, another in verse 15, you know, they go, they go back and forth talking about, you know, the pictures, and, and uh, I'm not going to go through all of them. But verse 15, here's a, here's a, you know, one, I think this picture, someone's speaking in different interpretations, but her brothers are, are in the story. They're introduced to us as an idea earlier already and uh, in chapter 1. But here there's this phrase in verse 15, catch us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. So again, in that image of, of, a, of a sort of a pasture or a garden, uh, there, are these, there are the foxes, you know, and they're going to come in, and they don't do tremendous damage all at once. But watch out for those little foxes that come in, and they'll spoil, they'll ruin it. And that's, that's one of the ones that I don't have a hard time, uh, you know, looking at the symbolism of it. Catch those little foxes. Watch out for them. And, and so often, it's such a good analogy of how relationships are. Watch out for the little things. You start getting sarcastic in a relationship where rather than just speaking the truth in love, you, the, you know, you've got something that really needs to be dealt with, but instead of dealing with it, you're saying just some, it's just a little fox, you know, just a sarcastic comment. Uh, we had some really good friends when we were first married. One of our uh, closest friends, the wife read a book. I don't remember the name of the book or what it was, but it was one phrase that rem- that she got out of it that really stuck with her, and she encouraged us the same way. Uh, the phrase was, sarcasm will ruin even the best relationships. You ever been around a family where everyone's sarcastic? Isn't it enjoyable? You know, like the whole time, it's just savage. You're like, do you guys hate each other? Like, no, no, we really love each other. Like, you don't, I don't think you do. Like, what? Just, like, well, is there an issue? Well, if there's an issue, let's bring it to the surface and resolve it, and then be done with it and be nice to each other. But, you know, or no, I'm just being sarcastic. You know, sarcasm is a tough one. It's a little fox. And you could probably think of many of those little foxes. Here's this relationship. You know, hey, watch out for those little things that can destroy it. And uh, those little foxes will destroy the vineyard. Now, uh, we have the phrase repeated. We looked at it this morning, verse 16. My beloved is mine and I'm his. He feeds his flock among the lilies. That phrase is repeated also three times. My beloved is mine, I belong to him. And that's kind of, I think, the theme of the, of the whole poem is, I belong to him and he belongs to me. And I think that's the main takeaway through all of this. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 5, uh, we have a repeat of the verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, it says in verse 5, it's slight change, but it says, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases so the idea, again, show restraint. Uh, by the time we get to chapter 3, um, you know, they're, they're, it's very passionate. They're very uh, much committed to each other. They're looking to each other. So chapter 3, verse 6 is where there's a change in the poem. And, and you'll see it here as we, we'll read through the end of the, through the rest of chapter 3. It says, Who is this coming out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant powders? Behold, it's Solomon's couch, and with it 60 valiant men around it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. And of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palanquin. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. 
Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day of the gladness of his heart. So up to this point, the relationship's begun, and they're interested in each other. It's very passionate. They're very excited about each other. But now, here's this announcement. Solomon's coming. And so this is the wedding. This is when the wedding happens. And Solomon comes up, his couch. He's being carried by all these guys. They're, he's got these mighty men of valor, and they come down, and he's going to protect her. He's got his army. Like, we're coming in the night. And, and some people speculate because there's a continual reference to Lebanon that perhaps she's in the far north, and so maybe it's a bit of a journey, and they even have to go kind of into another country. So he makes this journey to get his bride. Very similar to the New Testament times, you know, the ten virgins. Remember Jesus told a parable about ten virgins that are waiting for the bridegroom to come? Because the way that it worked in those days is you, you made the deal, you paid the dowry, which sort of set the contract. The dowry's been paid. You're essentially like Joseph and Mary. They were betrothed, right? Like to break a betrothal, you'd have to have a divorce. You pay the dowry, the contract's set, you haven't come together and become one. The marriage hasn't happened yet officially, but when the dowry's paid, it's a sealed deal. You're, you're, wait, you're just waiting. And then the bridegroom will come, and, when, and you know, when they're not ready, it was kind of part of the tradition. It would seem that they would come, and you know, kind of generally it's about to happen, but is it today? Is it tomorrow? Is it later? And he's preparing a place at his father's house for her, and then he's going to come and get her. And so all of a sudden, hey, the bridegroom's coming, the bridegroom's coming. So Jesus told a parable about ten virgins. Five were wise, five were foolish. The five that were wise had extra oil for their lamps. The five that were foolish did not have extra oil. They were not prepared for the delay. And they all fell asleep, all ten. Even the wise ones fell asleep. But then the announcement came, the bridegroom, the bridegroom. And so they, they woke up and some had oil. They got their lamps full of oil and said, here, we're ready, we're ready. This happening. And then the foolish ones didn't. And then they had to have oil or they couldn't participate. And so they got left out. It's a parable with a different emphasis, but it's using the common cultural idea of what would happen at the wedding ceremony. Now, I've got three daughters and two sons, and two sons are married, and one daughter now is married, and uh, our tradition is not like that. <laughs> and I, I don't know, it'd be a little bit weird where you're just like, when is it happening? I don't know when it's happening. Is he coming? I don't know. Or if you had a son, like, okay, son, when are we doing it? I was thinking next Thursday. How about Wednesday? I don't know. She's pretty excited. I don't think she can handle it. She can't wait. Her dad's going crazy. Or, you know, you've, you've, you've already gone to the family and you've made a deal. You know, you've, you've paid the dowry. You've, you've settled it. But when is it going to happen? Now, what should a wedding be like in the Bible? How many examples of weddings where we have a picture of the ceremony are there in the Bible? Zero. So that means where the Bible is silent, we're, we have liberty within what the principles of Scripture are to have a wedding how we want. So this is the picture. Solomon's coming. So this is the wedding. So if you were wondering where the wedding was, this is the wedding. And you can read through the imagery yourself. And they like each other. And, you know, he's under, she's under the apple tree and the, the fruit is tasty, right? So she's, they're, they're, they're involved. I mean, they're not involved sexually, but, but they're, there's, there's an intoxication that they have with each other. They're married now. So the imagery, you're going to see imagery that clearly moves into just what would be between a husband and wife. So you can enjoy that on your own as you read through this. I am not going to go through that. So... In chapter 4, well, here's one. I can do this one. I've always thought this is interesting. He, and he's describing her in chapter 4, uh, you know, verse 1, you know, her hair is like a flock of goats going down Mount Gilead, which probably would look beautiful, this cascading, you know, the flock just flowing, her hair's flowing. Um, I don't know that Gina would be super happy. You have, you're like a goat, honey, on the hillside. But look at verse 2. Your teeth... They're like a flock of shorn sheep, which has come up from the wash, washing, and listen, every one of, of which bears twins, and none is barren among them. You got all your teeth. And when you smile, there are no gaps. Remember we saw at the end of Ecclesiastes, it talks about how there's gaps in the windows, you know? So when you get older, the teeth are gone, they're falling out, you know? But here's the same kind of an idea of like, man, what do you think of that girl? She's got a whole mouthful. It's awesome, you know? When she smiles... She's got them all. So I'm done with that. Uh, jump down to verse 12. And here she's described, uh, this is, I think, important about sexual purity as it is before marriage. 
And what a great picture. A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse. A spring shut up, a fountain sealed. So her, she'd kept herself pure, waiting for marriage. Uh, and that's important. There's a great value in keeping yourself pure. What a great picture in your mind to say, there's a garden, but the garden's enclosed. The garden is to be opened for one person for one time. Uh, if you've failed, uh, there's no need to live in shame and in guilt. The Bible says, confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to wash, to wash it, cleanse it. So no need to feel guilty about this. And listen, if you need to confess and repent, then confess. And then from now on, be a garden enclosed. <laughs> Just say, well, I, I've made mistakes in the past, but from this point forward, you know, there's a holiness that's there. So uh, the world would say, the garden's wide open. Experience whatever you want to experience. Enjoy the garden. You do want, whoever wants to come to the garden, it doesn't matter. Boys, girls, whoever wants to come to the garden can come. I mean, the world, has, the world is so lost when it comes to this stuff and invites itself to so much uh, devastating, the devastating consequences of, of the quote-unquote liberty that the world is, says you should take. Is, the consequences are far-reaching. Uh, the Bible warns you can plant, you sow to the wind, and you reap the whirlwind. So don't listen to the world. The garden enclosed, that's a great uh, picture there. Uh, jumping down to uh, chapter 5, as, as they're described, they've come together, they're married, and uh, the imagery in chapter 4 is, is much more intense than the previous Im- imagery from before they're married. And so now they've come together. In chapter 5, it says, I've come to my garden. So chapter 4, verse 12, is there was a garden enclosed. And now they're husband and wife. He's come to the garden. My sister, my spouse, I've gathered my myrrh with my spice. I've eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I've drunk my wine with my milk. And then there's this phrase at the end of verse 1. Eat, O friends. Drink. Yes, drink deeply, O beloved ones. So we're looking at poetry. And so my, the Bible that we're passing out, that we let, you know, here it's one of these, right? It's from the, lot, from the hallway. So it has in parentheses that this is the beloved speaking to his friends. That's, a to- that's an interpretation. Uh, you may have a different interpretation. Your Bible may say, well, this is someone else saying this. Uh, I, may, I have several commentaries that all suggested that this is actually God speaking. This is God's speaking now that they've come together. And this isn't, a, this isn't the host of the party saying, hey, eat and drink, everyone. Enjoy the wedding celebration. Because the wedding would... The bride and groom would come together, but the wedding beast would last for a week, uh, minimum. So, um, you know, that's not our culture. Our culture is you, you rent the hall for four hours, you better be out, right? So we're, we're Americans. They're like, get in and get out. Uh, I have some good friends from Yugoslavia or Serbia now, and uh, the Serbian tradition is the bride and groom, the party, they get married during the day, and the party, the bride and groom don't leave until the sun rises, So on your wedding night, everyone sings and dances and eats and eats and eats and dances and sings and dances and eats and dances and sings. And then when the sun comes up, they let the bride and groom go. And then they continue to have the party for a whole week. And the bride and groom don't go on their honeymoon until the week-long party. So it's similar. So so there could be the idea that the party's going to go on. We've we've consummated our wedding now. We're married. But uh, everyone keep partying. But uh, I... I'm of the opinion, you know, and this is, and you can disagree with me, I'm not going to argue with you, but I think this is the Lord saying, eat, friends, eat and drink, drink deeply, enjoy it. It's a blessing from God. So uh, we'll see chapter, uh, same chapter, uh, verses 2 through 8, and uh, now we have a change. So we, they, they're, 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 they're in love with each other, then they get married, and then there's that imagery, and then now... Uh, the, they're, they're married, and so now there's a problem. Some time has passed, and uh, we're not giving any detail. Again, it's a poem, and it moves very quickly into a challenging time. There's some kind of separation that happens in chapter 5. I don't know if you noticed it when you were reading, but it happens very quickly. It's like, well, this wonderful thing has happened, and then all of a sudden she wakes up, and she doesn't know where he is, and you think, well, what, what happened? And uh, it's a poem. So in poem, I guess a poem's like a dream where you can just move around freely to, from one time period to another, from a different situation. You know, I don't know how your dreams are, but my dreams are freaky. So this poem moves very quickly to some other 
thing. And uh, verse two, she had said, I'm sleeping, but my heart is awake. It's the voice of my beloved. He knocks, open for me. Um, but then verse three, I, I've taken off my robe. She's like, puts him off. And, and then she wants him to come in, but then she doesn't. And then she's looking for him and he's gone in verse six. She goes out into the city, verse seven. She had asked them earlier in the poem, the watchman, it says, in verse seven. She talked to them before to try to find him as she was seeking for him at the beginning. And they helped her, but this time it says, the watchmen who went around the city, they found me. She's wandering, looking for him. When they found her, it says in verse 7, they struck me and they wounded me. So she gets beat up in the poem. The keepers of the walls, they took my veil away from me. And so I charge you, daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, tell you, that you tell him that I'm lovesick. And so then they ask her, well, what is your beloved more than any other beloved, O fairest among women? What is your beloved more than any others that you would charge us this? And then she says, oh, and she describes him, you know, he's, he's like ivory, you know, he's carved, he's like marble, he's, he's amazing, there's no one like him. And they ask her in chapter 6, verse 1, you know, where did he go? So she, something's happened, they're separated, she rebuffed him, we don't know what the details were, but in the poem there's some kind of, probably some time's passed, now they're in the city and now he's gone and she's trying to figure it out, but she remembers him and how much she loves him and and so he comes back, and uh, verses 2 and 3 of chapter 6, he comes back to the garden, and you can do whatever you want with your own symbolism there. He's gathering lilies in his garden. So verse 3, though, is that repetition of that, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine, and he feeds his flock among the lilies. So they're back together. There's been some discord. They come back. They're back. Chapter 7 is... Uh, more, I mean, all of chapter six, more, uh, you know, of them interacting. And chapter seven, uh, they're totally restored. They're back together. He's describing her. And uh, you can read that, not with your children. And uh, although, I don't know, verse two of chapter seven, your navel is a rounded goblet. I'm not sure that's a, uh, a compliment. That's an Audi, right? Like, like a whole goblet on your navel? Like, that's a serious Audi. Uh, she need to have a surgery deal with that thing. Um, or maybe I guess it's a little Audi and it looks like a little miniature goblet. I don't know. I mean, you know, this is why I don't go through, I'm not going to every verse. I would, be, I wouldn't, I was like be a comedy show for me. So you read through it. It's, there's a lot of passion here. They're making out in this chapter. <laughs> chapter 8. Uh, there's, there's chapter 8, verse 1. Just here's an image that maybe, you know, you struggled with. Verse 1 is a little bit, sounds weird up front, but you have to think of the culture. Chapter 8, verse 1 says, Oh, that you were like my brother who had nursed at my mother's breast. And, uh, and if I would find you outside, I could kiss you and I, I wouldn't be despised. So she's not saying, I wish that you were my brother, because then they wouldn't be able to be married. This is nothing like that. It's that in the culture, public displays of affection between husband and wife, you can't do. But if it's your brother, you can run and hug your brother and kiss him and be so happy. You know, it can be very demonstrative towards your brother in public. But, but the culture would say you can't with your husband, uh, because that's sexual and that's not supposed to be out in the public. But with a brother, it's not. So she's like, oh, that you were my brother and I could run and kiss you in front of everybody. You know, she's just full of passion towards him. Um, so if you were confused about that, that's, that is an image that probably is good to <clears throat> clear up. And then uh, chapter 8, verse 4, is the, the last of the three of the charges to show restraint. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. So that, that, the first two are identical. The last one is the one that's a little bit different. It leaves off the appealing and, the, and because of the does or the, you know, that, that motif. Uh, don't stir up or awaken love until it pleases. So three times, they're married now. And there's still the exhortation coming from her that show restraint. You want to you wanna have the happiest life? Show restraint. Uh, and, and I, I totally agree with her. <laughs> this poem is, is right on with that. Then uh, as we conclude, um, 
Her brothers are speaking in verse 8, and they're reminiscing back to the past. And here again, it's sort of a, the family responsibility, or they think about how, uh, you know, how they were treating her before. And so they, were, they played a role in helping protect her. It says in verses 8 and 9, we have a little sister. She has no breasts. What shall we do for our little sister in the day that she's spoken for? If she's a wall, we'll build upon her a battlement of silver. And if she's a door, we'll enclose her with boards of cedar. So we got a little sister. She's starting to come of age. She's not of age yet, but someone might be wanting to make the arrangements with our father for our sister. And the brothers are like, uh-uh. You know, if she's a wall, we're building a, a watchtower over her. If she's a door, we're walling it off. So brothers have a relationship uh, with interacting with their sister, you know, becoming of age. And, and then she responds. She has her own commitment. She says uh, in verse 10, I'm a wall. My breasts are like towers. Then I became in his eyes as one who found peace. So the brothers are, you know, as it concludes, they're reminiscing, you know, we would take care of our sister. And she goes, I'm taking care of myself. I, you know, I'm a garden enclosed. You know, I'm, I, I, I got my, you know, I, I got my guard up and no one's going to take advantage of me. And they speak about this vineyard. Perhaps there was some, maybe that's how he met her, something, unless it's a, an image, but maybe they met at this vineyard and that's why you have all this uh, motif of the pasture. So uh, that's the end. My own vineyard is before me. You dwell in the gardens. The companions listen for your voice. Let me hear it. And so make haste, my beloved. Be like a gazelle or a young stag on the mountains of spices. So it's all the picture of nature. Um, you might read some books. I, I know that there have been different teachings on this. Uh, some fellow who recently fell into sin and was proven to be totally corrupt had gotten a lot of fame by really taking this and be making it very graphic, which I was very disgusted by uh, you know, the fact that he became famous from that. So I don't think this was given to us as a manual for... Uh, you know, how to have a romantic relationship. I think it's, it's given to us. It's a parable. It's a poem. You see the passion. It's okay. It's in the Bible. It's okay to be passionate. They get married. They're married before the imagery changes where you say, this is clearly husband and wife. Well, there's husband and wife. That's why chapter four is after chapter three. Before that, though, they're, there's passion. They're, they're in love. There's, it's okay to be romantic. It's okay to have passion for, you should, and listen, if you're like, hey, it's fine. I got nothing. There's no fire, no flame, but I think I should marry. Well, they, no. Go into business together or something. Don't marry him. There should be some fire. There should be some passion. It's okay. It's not wrong. But, it's, but show restraint. I mean, so there's, there's a repetition here. I belong. There's three times I'm my beloved's and he is mine. And there's three times show restraint. So, I mean, it's pretty. If you look at it as a whole in a big picture, you see a couple of main points. So it is a poem. And I'm not saying the imagery's not there. You can read through it. But it's not rocket science to figure out the imagery. So I don't think you need my help. I'm totally comfortable with that. I don't feel like God's going to be mad. Like, you didn't explain it to them. I'm going to say, Lord, you could have come down and explained it to them. I'm <clears throat> this is our fourth time through the Bible. And I'm four for four. Okay, I'm not O for four. I'm four for four. <laughs> uh, you with me? So, all right. That, br that brings us to the next book, Isaiah. That's starting next week. So read Isaiah 1 through 10, and uh, he'll tell you the reign of the kings that are there, so you can look those guys up. We live in a day and age where, you know, there's, you just Google it. You know, what chapters is this guy in, and what chapters? You can go back and you can reread the history. He's a prophet in the south. He's with Hezekiah primarily during the time of Hezekiah, but he, he includes other kings. But his message doesn't, isn't only for the South. It also includes the North. It also is for other countries. Uh, and you'll get into some of that in your reading. So we'll connect that next week. We'll, we'll get into some of the world history behind it and the, the time period in which they're living and what the message is. And uh, 10 chapters of Isaiah next Sunday night. So Lord, thank you that you love us so passionately and that we were reminded of how uh, you've loved us and brought us to your banqueting house and your banner over us is love. We can't think of a, a more amazing and appropriate picture to think of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave up his life for us, to make us a home, that you've gone to your Father's house to prepare a place for us. And when that place is prepared, you're going to come again and receive us to yourself, and that we'll be with you always, that picture of a, of a wedding. And like Solomon came on his couches with his armies, you're coming 
with your armies and you're going to reign as king. You're, you're going to take your church to be your bride. We're going to heaven to the marriage supper of the Lamb as the bride of Christ and to return with you in glory as, as you take the, your rightful place as king. Lord, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for your broken body and your shed blood. Thank you for new life. Thank you for power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Pour out your power upon us, Lord, and make us your witnesses, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.